Asian Americans in Center County Speak Out. This event is presented by Community Diversity Group and State College's Community Engagement Office. Special thanks especially to Natalie who's been pulling this all together on Zoom since we started planning. And thank you for whatever it took you to get here. Let's take a moment to scroll through the Zoom gallery and see that we've all cared enough to come together here tonight. So Douglas, can you turn it back to gallery? So go to gallery view and then page through. So we've got 124 people here tonight. How wonderful. Okay. Now let's take a couple moments to become present. Take a few breaths through your nose. Exhale through your mouth. Feel your body supported by the earth and your feet firmly on the ground. Put attention on your breath. Breathe in light and exhale tension and exhale stress. In February, the Cultural Corners Committee of CDG decided to put on this event because it's Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Then the sen and the sense of urgency was driven by the increase in anti-Asian hate incidents. Then in March, six Asian women were murdered in Atlanta. And in April, four six were murdered at a FedEx warehouse where most of the employees were sick. Last Wednesday, an Asian woman was physically assaulted in Ferguson Township and told to go back where she came from. Several weeks ago, a Chinese grad student went to the emergency room here. While he lay there hooked up to IV tubes, a nurse he could not see told him, there's too many Chinese here and they don't go home, and then proceeded to grill him on his plans. According to Zensity, which analyzes data for local governments, 23% of comments online, that's almost one in four, in state college were negative this past year when referring to Asian Americans. And young people have been called names and spat upon. Nationally, StopAsianHate.org has received over 6,600 reports of hate incidents from last March to this March. May was made Asian Pacific American Heritage Month in 1992. This year, Center County, State College Borough, Ferguson, Half Moon, and Patton Townships all have been issued proclamations, some for the first time. I appreciate this acknowledgement. And honestly, I want to know what they're gonna do about it. From poet Maya Angelou, history, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Center County is located on the original homelands of the Shawnee and Susquehannock nations who were forcibly moved mainly to Kansas and Oklahoma. So we're left with beautiful Native American names like Allegheny, Juniata, Susquehanna, and Nittany, while only 0.7% of our state's population is Native American. Pennsylvania was the, also the site of the Carlisle Indian Industrial School until 1918, where the goal was the forced assimilation of Native children into white American society under the belief, kill the Indian, save the man, which has its roots in Christian doctrine of discovery. My name is Sheehan Ma, your host and moderator. I grew up in State College as one of 10 people of color in the state high class of 600. I'm a Penn State alum, went to Ghana with the Peace Corps, had a corporate life and spent four years in India with Ama the Hugging Saint. Since returning to Center County, I've been working to make this a happy valley for everyone. The paradox is we all want to be safe, loved and happy and we're diverse in many dimensions. It takes many types of thread to make a beautiful tapestry. And we're swimming in a soup of biases that we absorb and act on consciously and unconsciously. 
demographics have a big influence on people's lives. So, and here's another paradox. Both stereotyping and I don't see color are unrealistic and harmful. We need to hold the both hand. Our ego self-centered way of processing means we tend to dismiss, disbelieve, minimize, pathologize things that are not in our experience. So tonight, please feel into the experiences that are being shared. Feel into the history. Imagine yourself in Asian American shoes. Over the decades, I've been called many racial epithets. I was bullied in school over and over as dozens of other students sat by or walked by without intervening. Being smart, a student leader didn't protect me. Neither did it keep my medical mother doctor from being called a C word by the girl who sat in front of me in sixth grade homeroom. I ended up sitting next to the boy who tormented me most in high school at a state theater concert featuring African American music. He wanted to high five me. I wanted to ask if he was less racist than before and why he'd done what he'd done but I didn't want to embarrass him in front of his friends. 15 years before I was born, the US government put 120,000 Japanese Americans into concentration camps, while the vast majority of Americans said nothing. Most families lost everything. I'm sorry to say, I believe it's possible the same thing could happen to me if the US and China ever go to war, unless we change individually and as a society. So your caring enough to come here, to come to this event, gives me hope. Thank you. Let's keep in mind that there are more subtle forms of bias, racism, and discrimination than epithets and physical attacks, which manifest, for instance, as 12% of the country's professional workforce are of Asian descent while less than 1% of the S&P 500 CEOs are Asian, and Asian Americans are the least likely group to be promoted to management, less likely than any other racial group, including African Americans and Latinx folks. So what I'm asking is, please, let's stand up for each other, especially when we have rank and privilege, when we are which is around here, when we are white body, male, cisgender, educated, Christian, financially secure, fully abled. According to the Hollebeck bystander training, intervention training, four in five victims say that bystander intervention helped, but bystanders intervened only one time in four. There are ways to help without putting yourself in danger. Think about the possibilities. We're all going to die someday. Why were we born? What's the purpose of our lives? Holding biases is the opposite of love. And I've got them. So personally, I'm working to dissolve mine through educating myself with history, current events, people's lived experiences. Self-reflecting honestly, and it's not pretty at times, on my thoughts and behaviors, testing and watching for manifestations of my implicit biases. Empathizing, nurturing empathy by developing friendships outside my demographics and consciously imagining myself in other people's shoes. And acting taking bystander intervention training, paying attention to what's going on around me and seeing if I need to intervene, actively participating in efforts to make this a more equitable, welcoming place and to address systemic issues of discrimination and bias. May this event expand our hearts and minds and our resolve. This evening, I'm delighted and honored to present our panel of community members, Asian Americans working to make this community more inclusive, more just, more compassionate. 
representing just some of the diversity included in that Asian American label. We'll start with Nalini Krishnakuti, who will give us an overview of who we label as Asian Americans, including history we didn't learn in school and things we don't see in the media. She will also share some of her personal experience. Dr. Nalini Krishnakuti is a chemical engineer turned writer, educator, and speaker who's active in local and statewide efforts to build diverse, equitable, and inclusive organizations and communities. She's a first generation immigrant American, a Penn State alum, and a long time State College resident. Welcome, Nalini. Thank you, uh, Sheen Ma. Can you hear me? Yes. So let me share my screen. And as I'm uh, doing that, I want to say good evening to everyone. Um, and let me start. Um, I, and I also want to thank Sheen Ma for inviting me here. Uh, it's really amazing to have our community come together in solidarity. And what I'm going to do a little bit about in this segment is try to uh, unpack what that word Asian means. Now, before I do that, I want to give you a little bit of my backstory. I came to the United States more than three decades ago, and I came from this large, vibrant, diverse city of Mumbai in India, and I came to study chemical engineering at Penn State. Now, if you look at those black lines that showcase my journey, I was very lucky to travel from one green country to the other. And that just means I left the most populous democracy in the world, a free country, to the United States, which is a beacon of democracy all over the world. Now I got my master's and my PhD and I planned to return to India, but the universe had other plans. I met my husband here, we got married in Belafonte, and now I've lived here for almost three decades and I've also raised a daughter in State College. So I am a first generation immigrant. I'm also an American. And though I've lived here longer than anywhere else, I am often asked, where are you from? Now, my answer varies depending on who is asking it and how they are asking it. But for my daughter who was born here, there's only one answer, State College. Now this question, which is asked even by people from API communities is sometimes due to stereotypes about people who look like me or my daughter. As Chinua Achibe says, the whole idea of a stereotype is to simplify. Instead of going through the problem of all this great diversity, that it is this, or maybe that, you have just one large statement, it is this. So I ask you to do this exercise. Look at this word, American, and don't take too long, but try to think, what are the words that come to your mind when you see these wor this word? Who are the people that come to your mind when you see this word? Do the same thing with the word Asian. What words come to your mind when you see this word? Who are the people that come to your mind when you see this word? Now think about the answers. Did you think of people of Asian Pacific Islander communities when you saw the word American? And did you think of American when you saw that word Asian? If the answer to either question is no, if we did not think of people of API origin as Americans, then certainly we are simplifying, using stereotypes both about Asians and about Americans. Now this matters. Asian Americans make up about 6.2% of the United States population we are the fastest growing immigrant group in the country. We are 3% of Pennsylvania, 6% of Center County, 9% of Patton Township, about 11% of the borough, and 15% of Ferguson Township. Now that word Asian, which countries do people of Asian origin come from? Some people think of China, some people think of India, but that's kind of where it stops. Now the word Asian itself is interesting. You might have heard it said that there are no blacks in Africa. In the same vein, there are no Asians in Asia. 
Asia is one of the most diverse regions of the world with countries in Southeast Asia, East Asia, Central Asia, and South Asia. Someone who looks Indian like me could in fact be from Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Nepal, Myanmar, Bhutan, or even from Malaysia and Singapore. Someone who looks Chinese could be from East Asian countries like Taiwan, Japan, North or South Korea, or from Southeast Asian countries like Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, East Timor. They could even be from South Asian countries like Nepal or Bhutan. So there are no Asians in Asia, but there are Asian Americans in the United States, a term created to bring together people in the 60s and the 70s during the civil rights movement, when Americans of Chinese, Filipino, Japanese origin came together in strength to stand up for their rights. This term then expanded to include Southeast Asians and South Asians. It's now a term used in the US census to indicate people from these regions. South Asia, Far East Asia, and Southeast Asia. But Central Asia is not included, neither is West Asia, usually called the Middle East. Now let's think of the term Asian American Pacific Islanders. Here's a map of the Pacific Islands and Pacific Islander communities are very, very invisible in the American conversation and public space. So Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are diverse. We are of different ethnic and national origins. We practice all the major religions, and we come from areas that have long established civilizations and have contributed much to the world from philosophy to medicine to science and culture. We speak many languages and have our own interrelationships and history. Now in the United States, the six largest groups are people of Chinese, Indian, Filipino, Vietnamese, Korean, and Japanese origins. And then of course you see the others and they come from many, many, many different countries in the world. Now the current category of Asian Americans lumps us all together, reinforcing stereotypes like the model minority, when actually we are a group with a wide range of income, language access, and educational levels. So we have just a wide variety. In fact, Asian Americans have the largest in-group income inequality in the United States. And the top 10% of earners had 10.7 times the income of the bottom 10% compared with a national average of just 8.7 times as a difference. So even in areas where we are present in proportions larger than our numbers in the general population, disaggregating the data to reveal the truth of individuals is essential. We may need active recruitment of groups that are disadvantaged within Asian Americans, example, refugee populations, those who have language access issues, and even some uh, who have financial access issues. So an action item here. I encourage you to look at the word Asian, figure out the complexities of that word for each individual or group, whether it's in a newspaper, an application form, or whether it's an adjective you apply to a colleague or a neighbor. Now there's another way Asian Americans are diverse, and this is to do with when we came here. Some of us are recent immigrants, we came on professional visas, some are recent refugees, but some of us have been here since the 1700s. In 1763, Filipino sailors who were working on Spanish ships jumped ship in the New World to escape servitude. They traveled across the Gulf into Louisiana's Bayou country and settled there and came to be known as the Louisiana Manila men. Filipinos with eight to 10 generations in the New World are the oldest continuous Asian American settler community in North America. You may have heard of, you may have heard of Chinese immigrants who came here during the gold rush. And you may have heard of Chinese and Japanese laborers coming to Hawaii. Some, of, some were recruited and some came under contract. In the same period, Chinese laborers were recruited for the transcontinental railroad. And here are pictures of sick men from Punjab in the 1900s on the West Coast. They worked on farms, lumber mills, on railroads, and came to escape the lack of freedom under British colonial rule. Many were active in India's independence movement from the British. 
So again, action. What if instead of assuming that someone of API origin is a perpetual immigrant, what if we assume that they are the descendants of people who came in the 1700s, the 1800s, or the 1960s? What if we assume they belong here? If we want to find out their cultural or ethnic origins, it can come up naturally in conversation. They may even tell you if that information is important. And if they are recent immigrants, what if we assume they still belong as most immigrants are here because immigration is a two-way street that benefits both us and them. Now coming on to anti-Asian hate. Many seem to think this is recent, but the truth is anti-Asian hate is as American as apple pie. Asians experienced intense hatred, including violence, arson, murder, lynching, and mass evacuations. Here you see a caution about the dusky peril where Hindu hordes are said to be invading the state. This is an article from September 16, 1906 about the Hindu immigration to Bellingham, Washington, where in 1907, 400 to 500 white people actually beat sick mill workers and drove them out of town. Here is an example, I don't know why that's happening of another um, place where um, Sikhs are being driven out of town in California. Now Sikhs wear turbans as an article of faith and this anti-Sikh feeling continues to this day. Many of you, you may remember the shooting and murders in 2012 in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, while people were gathered in prayer in a Gurudwara, the hate crimes and murders after 9-11, and just recently the killings in the FedEx facility in Indianapolis. Anti-Chinese sentiment was very high in the late 1800s to early 1900s as shown in these cartoons. The last one that I'm showing you actually says that communists, nihilists, socialists, Fenians and hoodlums are welcome, but no admittance to China men. Of course, this is a satire on the situation in those days. Now, when the immigration, uh, immigrant population in the country rose to its highest level of 15%, this hatred manifested into laws, including the Page Act and the Chinese Exclusion Act, which were mentioned in the opening video. You can draw a straight line from these um, acts of hatred to the anti-Asian sentiment during COVID-19. The AAPI hate that's being experienced is being experienced while people of AAPI origin are serving disproportionately in the healthcare industry and are overrepresented in small business. Now there's also a myth that people of AAPI, um, Asian Pacific Island origin do not speak up. If we did not speak up, what happened? How did we get from there to here? What can we learn from the actions in the past of our speaking up, of our uniting? our contributing, our organizing with others in solidarity. Here are a few examples. In 1857, San Francisco opened a public school for Chinese children, but then changed it to an evening school two years later and then closed it entirely. Thanks to continuous efforts from the 1850s, the Chinese community got regularized public education after the successful legal challenge almost 30 years later. The California Supreme Court ordered state educators to offer public schooling to eight-year-old Mamie Tape and other Chinese children. The state education authorities then maneuvered successfully to circumvent the law, creating separate schools, mandating that all Chinese and Mongolian children be segregated into them. Therefore, Japanese, Asian Indian, Filipino, and Korean children, as they arrived in succession, were segregated into the officially designated Oriental school. But this required people speaking up and fighting. The next one is the story in 1898 of Wong Kim Ark, who was born in the United States. His parents returned to China when job opportunities here declined. When Wong Kim Ark came back here as a cook in the Sierras, he went back to China twice, once to get married and then another one was a family visit. But when he came back along with his papers and an affidavit from a white man that he indeed was born in the United States. He was not allowed to land. The California Supreme Court, um, you know, took his case, actually said that Wong Kim Ark should be allowed 
it, it, they actually said they don't agree that he should have citizenship, but this is the, you know, the rule of the land. It was actually a group of um, peop, uh, Chinese six companies, a group of uh, organizations that came together and helped Wong Kim Ark take his case to the Supreme Court where he won. And this is the case on which we have birthright citizenship to this day. Again, another example of speaking up. Now I just ask you, I don't know if I'm running out of time, but if I am running out of time, Google the 442nd regimental unit. Despite the growing racism during World War II, many Japanese Americans answered the call to war. The 442nd Regimental Combat Team, a segregated Japanese American unit, is remembered today for its brave actions in World War II in Italy and France, and is the most decorated unit for its size and length of service in the history of the U US military. The unit totaling about 18,000 men got over 4,000 Purple Hearts, 4,000 Bronze Stars, 560 Silver Star Medals, 21 Medals of Honor, and seven Presidential Unit Citations. Their motto was going for broke. Now, considering the importance of Penn State and all the um, students in our community, I wanted to give another like uh, context. Our students, obviously, the, who come here, the immigrant students, they um, contribute to our economy, of course, but they also contribute to education, research, and innovation. And many, many, many of our departments actually could not survive if, these interna if our international students were not here. But what happens when we actually allow some, uh, the, our international students uh, to stay if they wanted to? I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. One is the example of Fazlur Khan, a Bangladeshi Muslim American who came here as a graduate student and is today considered the father of the modern skyscraper. I always found it ironic that the 9-11 terrorists who were also Muslim brought down skyscrapers that were um, standing because of Fazlur Khan who was also Muslim. Here's a Google Doodle honoring him. I want to then move to Peter Tsai, who was a graduate student from um, Taiwan. And he is the person who invented the filter for the N95 masks that we all came to rely on during the pandemic. I want to end my section with another celebration of the numerous companies that have been started by people of Asian origin. And among that, since I won't have the time to go to all of them, I want to highlight Zoom because of which, again, we made it through the pandemic. So here's one more action item for all of us. Find these untold stories, celebrate them. And I think they also give us examples of how we speak up, how we contribute, how we come together. And these stories that I have shared, they are just a tip of the iceberg. So thank you so much. And I hope I didn't go too much over my time. Oh, thank you so much, Nalini. I learned so much. Um, thank you for this really, really broad perspective and setting us up for what we're going to hear next. Okay, so um, now I'd like to introduce our next panelist, who's Judge Don Han. Donald Dong Myung Han is currently serving his second year as Magisterial District Judge in Center County having been elected in 2019. A Center County native and son of Korean American immigrants, he was elected three times to the State College Borough Council in 1995, 2005, and 2009 as council president in 2012 and as mayor in 2017. Welcome, Don. Thank you. Thank you for every, everything you do, Shin Ma. Um, let me see, the, uh, my name is, Don Han, and uh, I am actually a proud Center County native. Um, I was born in uh, Belfont shortly before, uh, well, I was uh, shortly after uh, my parents came to State College to uh, my dad uh, had a job as a math professor. Uh, tell you, my uh, earliest memories uh, were somewhat benign, but rather um, 
Let me see. I, I just remember that growing up as a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, uh, people used to stare at me constantly. I mean, it's sort of like whenever I went over to, uh, into public, uh, it was really all that innocent and I, sort of innocent curiosity, but it is I have to say for a three, four or five year old, it was a little bit nerve wracking, but I was still innocent. Uh, I, my, uh, I went to elementary school at Coral Street. Uh, essentially we had small classes there. We got to know each other. We spent uh, time uh, with each other. It, is, it was a great experience. Uh, however, unfortunately things changed quite a bit when I went to junior high school. Uh, with a class size of 200 people, um, uh, that was when I experienced a lot of harassment. Uh, a lot of uh, my classmates, well, I would say it was really done by about 10% of my classmates. But the thing is, and uh, but you know, they would call me chink, they would call me jap, they would call me nip. Uh, basically, they would uh, frequently slant their eyes at me. Uh, they made fun of my name, uh, ding dong, uh, making bell sounds. Uh, basically, I remember, uh, I, my estimate is that I, and I have to admit, I didn't keep record of this, but my estimate was that I experienced it about every other day because my recollection was that I wanted to, uh, I was hoping like that there would be a day in which I didn't have to feel like I was different. And I was also thinking, you know, hoping that, you know, that it would grow into two days or three days and that uh, I would gain some confidence over that. But unfortunately, my recollection was during that time, I, uh, that didn't happen very often. Um, fortunate, uh, in fact, I think that I, uh, one of my friends used to uh, describe me as a kid who, was, who went down the hall being afraid of his own shadow. Um, Essentially, uh, uh, fortunately, I have to say that uh, uh, I experienced less harassment while I was in high school and college, and even less after I was uh, became 30 years old. Uh, you know, quite frankly, I mean, half, uh, since then, I mean, I have to say it was a very proud moment when I was elected first time for borough council by 19 votes. And uh, the second and third time I was elected uh, uh, by two to one margins, um, and uh, and uh, it was elected mayor by uh, by over nine hundred votes. I mean, it basically uh, helped uh, um, me re uh, reaffirm, I think, uh, my dis uh, my love of state college, uh, and I do love state college still. Uh, however, I'm sort of noticing with really uh, with some trepidation that a lot of the victims of anti-Asian hate nowadays are uh, basically reputedly young people, uh, kids and, and the elderly. And I have to say that it, I do have some concern as to what I have to look forward to. Um, I'm hoping uh, that, uh, that uh, State College in Center County remains uh, the wel uh, a welcoming community and, but I think that it's important. I did not really have that many allies when I was growing up. Uh, one of the things that hurt the most was not necessarily uh, the, the slings and arrows of the, uh, of the 10%, but really the silence of the 90%. Um, and uh, it is, uh, and I, I do wanna thank you all for coming here uh, and, and sharing with us, because I think that it is only through allyship and building bridges and connections that, uh, that we will have, uh, that we will have a, 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 well, a good future together. Thank you. Oh, beautiful, Don. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and yes, this is the future that we all hope for and we need to do the work for. Um, so our next presenter is Haesun Kim. Haesun Kim was born and raised in South Korea where she received, received an MA in English language and literature. She came to the US in 1994 to get an MA in educational psychology in Missouri <laughs> and relocated with her family to Happy Valley in 2005. 
She teaches Korean language and Korean pop culture at Penn State Altoona and volunteers with a number of local organizations. <laughs> Welcome, Hesan. Thank you, Shima. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share my immigration and my identity story and a bit of my family story with you tonight. First, how would I define myself? Which took a bit of a courage, and this is first time ever for me to, to do this. So obviously I'm a mother, straight woman, Asian American, one Buddhist, feminist, an ally of uh, marginalized and voiceless groups. I'm a nature lover, gardener, lover of insects, butterflies, and moths. I'm also a privileged second generation college educated person. My father's family embraced the teachings of one Buddhism. This year, we are celebrating the 106th year of its foundation. The one Buddhist order was established during the darkest hours of Korean history during the colonial days of Imperial Japan. The founding motto by the Sutesan Park Jung Bin was that with technological and material advancement, the cultivation of spirituality becomes more urgent and critical. So education, public mindedness, and equal opportunity for both men and women were highly promoted within my religious order. I always tell my kids with thank goodness, we all became one Buddhist with our quick temper and impulses, what would happen to us? We can all now reflect on how to respond with this mundane, this ever challenging uh, stimulus. We all, my family all became very civilized and friendly people with all the sitting meditations rituals to follow to calm down the angry and wandering minds. My kid would gladly agree that I'm very social and friendly person, not afraid of striking a conversation with the new faces. Obviously, this is an acquired trait of my family. Most of them are ordained one Buddhist ministers. I wanted my boys to have this close community experience, so they joined Boy Scout to do just that. Scouting families are like my extended family members here in Center County. For the, 15, for the past 15 months, since the March lockdown, we were given this unwanted yet nonetheless grateful opportunity to reflect on our busy lives. We also experienced far too many deaths people we know or may not know in person. The entire world suffered together. What followed afterwards was expression of anger, frustration of many people. The fear of the unknown, ignorance, frustration was un once again directed at Asian Americans, as some people call the pandemic as a China virus. The rise of random attacks on elderly Asian Americans has been rising. Then another tragic mass shooting happened in Atlanta, Georgia on March 16th. How the US media responded first to the shooting puzzled me initially, as they implied those victims as sex workers. And one police spokesperson even said the perpetrator had a bad day. Really? As six of those victims were Asian heritage, Korean news media had been following the development of the news as well. And it took a while for all the details to come out. I have noticed how this US media is talking about the 21 year old perpetrator as a sex addict. And he was a regular at the, some of the massage parlors in Atlanta. The attack was initially not even a racially charged crime at all. And this got me think, it is how Asian women are being depicted by the media, but why, how? One of the victims was a 63-year-old Buddhist Korean woman named Young A. Yu. Her two Korean Black American sons remembered Young A as a selfless person who stood up against discrimination and consistently advocated for treating people right. Asian women, we are not invisible, compliant, and obedient masses. I'm a unique being with own set of belief system own issues and still brave enough to come here. Let us recognize this new immigrant as a contributing member of the community, civil society, and America at large. I genuinely believe that now and once again, 
This is the watershed moment for the Asian Americans for the making of American history. We need to reconcile our own tragic past, which is to see Asian Americans not as a perpetual foreigners to move forward. With one breath at a time, we can reach out to get to know each other and heal the wounds. It doesn't have to be all the people you meet, just one person at a time. You can make a difference. Immigrants are asset, not a threat to our new home, America, or home country like Korea. I explained the complexities of American politics and popular culture to my family and friends back home. I am teaching Korean language and pop culture. This gives me a rigid reason to indulge hours of Korean dramas, reality TV shows like Masked Singers, and also a mini documentary featuring real people just like me and you, which is a big digital storytelling. Korean waves such as Korean drama, K-pop, Korean food, fashion have also made a big wave since 2013, especially during the COVID lockdown. One can't enjoy those cultural products from Korea while disliking or even hating ethnic Koreans or recent immigrants like me making a living here. So this is my story based on my own upbringing. This is who I am and I hope my children can carry part of the tradition with them. Let us not put Asian American into a single narrative. Everyone is different. They are common thread though that binds us all together which is we all want to be a good people. Regardless of skin color and ethnicity, we are people. We are the protagonists in our own story. We need to do the, we need to do the hard work to build more equitable and inclusive civil society for all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Hesun. Yes, you're right. We belong here. And even though I look at my own conditioning to think that sometimes I don't see myself as American sometimes, this is the soup we're swimming in, but we absolutely do belong here. And we all need to work on it, Asian and non-Asian. Thank you. So um, now we welcome Celeste Good. Celeste is a student majoring in kinesiology. She's the past president of QTPOC, Queer and Trans People of Color. She's done so much activism work within the Penn State community for people of color, the black community and the LGBTQ plus community that she was one of only 15 students in her class selected for the Lion's Paw Senior Society. Okay. Welcome Celeste. Um, awesome, uh, my name is Celeste Good. Um, as you know, I'm a student here at Penn State and I have been for the last four years. I'm actually going to be the current president of QDPOC for next year or the next two semesters once it's a re-registered organization on campus and I am also the vice president of OPETA caucus uh here at Penn State um a little bit so I'm just gonna be talking about like my story and my experience as an Asian American so I mean I was born in Shenzhen China I have a twin sister and we were adopted by two white parents um because of this I never really felt Asian enough to be in Asian spaces. So I also grew up in Rhode Island, which is also in predominantly white areas. And the schools that I went to were private and Catholic. So, you know, again, predominantly white spaces for the majority of my life until I came to Penn State. Uh, something that I learned, I guess, the last couple months is that, you know, there's no one way to be Asian. And I think the only reason I know that now is because you know, of the, the events that have taken place and, you know, talking to other Asian Americans because I never really had the spaces for that and I didn't have the people to talk to. I personally have a lot of identities that I care about. Um, you know, I identify as queer and I'm in the LGBTQ, LGBTQ community. My pronouns are she, her, her, but sometimes gender is complicated and that's something I'm currently trying to figure out. But, you know, the hardest identity for me to embrace has been my Asian American identity. Um, I've always felt disconnected from other Asian Americans because I didn't grow up in a traditional Asian household. I don't know anything about Asian American history. I don't know what kind of holidays we celebrate um, because I had white parents. And, you know, I'm also not a typical, I guess, Asian woman. Like from what I see or what I like see on social media, like an Asian woman has long hair you know, they dress feminine and like they're usually quiet. Um, 
and I'm, I'm none of those. And because of that, I have, while well, at Penn State, like, gone through different not great experiences with Asian organizations here. Like I've been kicked out because I talk about politics or because of like my sexuality. And it's kind of deterred me from being in Asian spaces and that kind of sucks. But, you know, with, with the rising hate crimes and COVID and what happened in Georgia, it kind of opened my eyes to the injustices that Asian Americans face. I, I know that, I know that there have been like a, there, there's a history of hate crimes against Asian Americans, like since the beginning of like America. And, you know, I don't know why this had to wake me up or the recent events, like were what opened my eyes and made me want to dive into my Asian heritage. But, you know, it did. And I'm kind of happy that it did because I, I've put that on the back burner because it's been the hardest to look at and deal with because I don't have any experience with it and I I don't feel Asian enough to be in spaces and you know I felt a lot I've faced a lot of microaggressions or macroaggressions whether it be like my sexuality or my race like when I was in high school I, w I went to Boston and some some woman like chased me a, like a couple blocks and like told me to get out of her country or like sexuality wise like people just tell me like I'm going into the wrong bathroom because I have a short hair and they're like, get out of the woman's bathroom because you like you, you look like a man. Um, and like that sucks. You know, like in, in middle school and high school, like I I had the jokes about like the eyes, or like I'm not gonna be able to drive well and like small microaggressions like that. And I wasn't educated enough, or no one told me that those are things that you shouldn't do to kids. And like how do we as people who grow up with microaggressions, like how do we stop that and you know like no one ever told me to speak up about those types of things and you know it's I, I guess without education the hate and everything that happens to like marginalized people like that's going to continue um until we start speaking up and until we start educating ourselves and that's kind of what I want like what I've been trying to do with my Penn State experience you know I shouldn't have to fear doing mundane things because of who I am and, you know, while the events that have happened have definitely rattled me, they've also sparked something in me. Um, you know, I have been, you know, as I've said, I'm not really comfortable in Asian American spaces or like with my own identity. Um, I chose to apply for the executive board for PETA caucus, which is an undergrad student um, organization here at Penn State. And I'm hoping I'm able to explore my identity while serving the PETA caucus community. You know, I want to feel comfortable and confident in my own community, and that's not that's not something I've ever felt yet. So, I also want there want to be there for people in my community, because I I helped with the help of Stephen Zhang um, put together a vigil after what happened in Georgia, and like I didn't think that many people were going to come out, and then we had a lot of people, so it was really nice to see. Um, but I think social justice when it comes to Asian voices, like I haven't seen a lot of that. I remember how many, you know, Asian American people were speaking up for the hate crimes when COVID started, but like when George Floyd was murdered, those same voices didn't say anything. So it's like, we can't as allies cherry pick what we care about. You know, I strongly encourage people to talk to each other and learn about like what makes each other each other because we're, we're, we're so very similar, like, every community deals with colorism, racism, and homophobia, and many other things that need to be unlearned. And it just takes time and education. And, you know, like, I guess that's what I've learned in my experience as an Asian American woman. Um, and I think although what this year has been tough, I think it brought a lot of people together, like, like this event. And I'm really thankful that people came on and wanted to listen to these stories. Um, lastly, I want to thank everyone who put this together it was definitely nice to have a space to learn and tell my story in. Well, thank you, Celeste. We're so glad. We're so glad you came. Thank you for your honesty. And you belong. You belong. Just know that, please. Okay, so um, our final presenter is Stephen Zhang. Stephen is a student at Penn State 
studying economics, political science, and international affairs. He is an at-large representative at University Park Undergraduate Association and president of APETA Caucus, where he advocates for social justice and increases in accessibility and equity of resources for students at Penn State. Welcome, Stephen. Yeah, uh, thank you, Shian Mai. Thank you so much for reaching out to me about this panel, this event, and uh, thank you everyone who has spoken so far. Um, I, I think, you know, so many people have already touched upon so much that I wanted to talk about today. So there definitely will be a, a few repeats and um, themes and stuff. But if anything, this really just reaffirms that so many of these issues have existed and continue to exist across a lot of these different Asian cultures, generations, and boundaries. Um, and that something really needs to be done about it. Um, I wanted to speak a bit today on my experience and insights growing up as an Asian American in our country. Um, I was extremely lucky to find a community of advocates here at Penn State who are willing to support me, help me grow out of my comfort zone. Um, however, my venture into advocacy and social justice is one that I found isn't common against uh, with a lot of Asian Americans due to the expectations that America has continued to put on our communities. Um, I also want to preface to that what I say is purely based on my experiences alone. Um, to start off, you know, I really want to start with the question, right? What is the last time when you looked at an Asian individual and you assume that they are naturally smart, that you assume that they are likely to be a doctor, a lawyer, an aspiring entrepreneur, that they're stoic and hardworking? Perhaps at one time you reached out to an Asian for help on something math related or made a lighthearted comment that something, someone is smart because they are Asian. And while these words can be interpreted as positive or even a compliment to the recipient, um, in truth, they really continue to perpetuate stereotypes that Asians struggle to really break out of. Stereotypes that some may feel they must force themselves to, you know, undertake in order to assimilate, in order to find success. Um, America tells many of its Asian citizens that they are the model minority, that they're the prime example that hard work, determination, and quote unquote, staying out of trouble will guarantee achieving the American dream. However, this model minority myth is entirely backwards. It's not obedience that leads to success. Rather, I feel like we're very much siloed into this narrow section of society and the American experience because we aren't given the support we need to enrich our lives in other directions, in other ways. To an outsider, it is hard work and stoicism that leads to our success. But the stoicism is brought on by silent suffering and knowing that there are little to no support systems for us to turn to otherwise. As a high schooler, I focused on achieving high grades because college is quote unquote, the only path to success that is shown to us. Now colleges are becoming increasingly exclusive to the Asian community because there are too many Asians with high grades and SAT scores that are applying to elite colleges. I tried applying one time to a person of color leadership summit at a consulting firm last year for an internship only to find that the event was reserved for black, Latino and indigenous people, presumably because there are probably enough Asians in business the same way that there are enough Asians at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and the likes. Of course, you know, never mind that Asians are among the most least likely uh, to be promoted to leadership positions, never mind that Asian communities face some of the highest poverty rates in the country, and that we are described as a monolith even when it's not true. Never mind that I'm a person of color who feels like an outsider in our society, reminded that I don't seem to belong here, always asked where I'm really from, even though I'm a born and raised PA native who enjoys the same nature trails, car shows, and deep fried Oreos at the county fair, as many of you all do. Now, this isn't a rant or tirade on affirmative action or support systems for other communities. I'm so glad that companies are recognizing the need to support our BIPOC brothers and sisters and other diverse communities of color absolutely need these programs to succeed. They face barriers that have been imposed on them by society as well. However, it feels like the APETA community is being set aside because we're doing quote unquote good enough by American standards despite the suffering that many endure. And it's really a shame that our country continues to pit our communities against each other to compete for the same resources instead of offering all of us a place to grow and express ourselves. For the longest time, I felt like a statistic. I felt like I was perceived by everyone as nothing more than my GPA or my SAT score or the medals or the accolades that I would have come graduation for high school um, and, and soon to be college after next year. And so that was what I really just focused on. I've been told many times that my path would lead to great financial security, but never that I would be a change maker or a leader. Many of my Asian peers report feeling invisible, report feeling powerless, unsure how to act or speak out. Society has framed us as status quo professionals, but rarely leaders. I barely had any support on my way to discovering my own leadership until students and mentors from other communities, other races, other backgrounds reached out and taught me how to empower myself. So really it's no surprise that 
people are now taken aback or taken by surprise when the amount of hate perpetuated towards Asians has been uncovered. The reality is that there, it's been there the entire time, but we've been told time and time again by this model minority myth to stay silent, to mind our own business, and to not trouble others. Over the past year, over hundreds of anti-Asian hate crimes across America have been reported, but we only continue to see these accounts being reported on niche media sources catering to the Asian community and the rest perpetuated by word of mouth. It is an outrage that took the murder of eight people in Atlanta, Georgia, for mainstream media to even pick up on these hate crimes, when hundreds were reported before, resulting in hospitalizations and deaths of elderly Asian citizens due to violence and assaults. The silence on the Asian experience in America is tangible and many of us feel like we're treated like outsiders. And it's a no wonder when no one wants to speak out because we can't be sure that there will be anyone out there to support us or listen to us. Now, I wanna thank the APEDA community and all the others who continue to be empowering voices and allies for the community. I certainly was not born a leader or a public speaker. And it was really through the assistance of mentors in my life that I found a voice. We all are born with a light inside us and enthusiasm to be change makers and leaders of the future. However, the silence and apathy that Asians experience in everyday life extinguishes this light. It's not just about being there in times of tragedy, but reaching out to actively break existing stereotypes and empower the APITA community. Encourage the dreams and aspirations of younger generations in your APITA community. Reach out to them and let them know that they're able to make a change when society seems to forget their voice. Change begins with preparing a generation of leaders and the APITA community vitally needs to know that they have a platform to stand on remind them that they're not invisible. Thank you so much. Well, wow, thank you so much, Stephen. I'm laughing kind of ruefully relating to so much of what you said. Um, and yes, you're right. We need to we need to stand together and we need to, yeah. Look, don't let get me going on the model minority myth, which I believe for way too long was being positive. And I'm only now seeing the negativeness of it. Okay, so I saw something in the chat. Somebody was concerned this is only lasting an hour. Sorry, folks, you've got another half an hour. We're going to do Q and A's and discussion and as best we can on Zoom, and um, then we'll end about at uh, eight thirty. So, thank you all so much for being here. Um, with the Q and A portion, um, Zoom is not the ideal way to do this. And it's enabled us to reach beyond center county. So in any case, it's what we have. Given recent Zoom bombings and other racist incidents, we've taken precautions like requiring registration. So at this point, please put your questions and comments in the chat. Um, if it's a question, please put a cue in front of it so it's really easy for us to see and the rest of it you can just comment, okay? So it's, the, it's open now for questions. Um, the panel is shown, um, is pinned or whatever, so you can see us all and we can all unmute and actually have a conversation. Um, so while we're waiting for the questions to start, this is my question to the panelists if all of you have like one sentence on it or two sentences. Given everything that you individually have shared, is there one thing you wish everyone would know would take home with this, would take, some insight or some resolve to take away. Um, I can go. Are you ever just doing like one sentence or like? One sentence, short. I mean, not paragraph. Um, right? I mean, I guess I would say that like when talking to people about micro and macro aggressions and like I'm talking about like your closest friends because those are the people who you should be correcting rather than being like, oh, they're my best friend. Like, I'm not gonna do it because like, I don't wanna like create a gap between us. But like, those are the people who should most likely like understand why you're saying these things. And they're the people who should be also like doing that to other people. Like if they're not correcting their friends, then you need to correct them and tell them like, it's your job, even if you're not like Asian or like in a minority to correct it. And that goes for, homophobia, racism, ableism, and like everything else, you know? Yes. Thank you, Celeste. Somebody else? She and Ma, for me, the very, very simple thing is that um, Asian Americans being seen as the individuals we are. That each of us here is this amazing, you know, we are all individuals, we are not a stereotype, we are different, we're amazing. I want, to, I want to follow up on what Nalini said. Um, essentially, uh, 
I get the impression that there is some hope that there is some manual that will help guide people through uh, way how to deal uh, with minorities. And I think that uh, that we have to realize, uh, quite frankly, if I had a manual that helped me um, do, uh, uh, with my relationship with my wife, that would be great too. But the thing is, everyone is so complex. Right. And I think that quite frankly, we're uh, our complex and we change as well. Uh, and I think that uh, I think that uh, the key is to treat uh, uh, to uh, to uh, encounter us as individuals uh, with different different backgrounds, and uh, you know, quite and quite frankly, changing attitudes as well. Um, yes, true. Thank you, Don. I also want to say that in terms of immigration wave, I belong to like a fourth generation for Korean Americans uh, because I came 1990s when Korean government allowed anyone with the money can study abroad. And most of my friends, the cohort group, they went back to Korea working professionally. So I see myself as a bridge builder between Korea and my new home, America. Yes. Thank you, Hazel. I think Ethan, do you have in something? Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, I think two of the most you know jarring quotes that I continue to to kind of play in my head um, after the the Atlanta shootings um, from just students that I've talked to. Um, one of them is a comment from someone when we were organizing it who said, um, "You know, thank you so much for organizing this. I've been waiting for this." and um, others who continue to kind of talk about their silence and, and feeling like they're not sure where to speak or they feel invisible. And I think the, the two really play upon each other and, you know, really emphasizing how much the, the APETA community has, you know, had to, had to stay in silence about a lot of these issues. And just because we don't talk about it or just because we, we aren't um, actively discussing these issues doesn't mean that there's nothing wrong with it. I think a lot of people often think, you know, oh, like the Asian community is very strong because they're always bouncing back and they're always just moving forward without um, voicing concerns or anything. So they must be fine. And, and that's not the case. And I didn't know that was not the case until I came to Penn State, until I interacted with, with the APETA communities. Um, and I think, you know, so many people are suffering silently. And it's more so because within a lot of these communities, when you feel like an outsider, you don't really want to interact with other people until you know you can trust them very fully. And you never know who you want to confide in, why you, and, and when to confide in them. So it gets really tough for people to reach out um, actively, especially when they see issues because they don't quote unquote want to be a burden, which is something I continue hearing time and time again as well. So I, I think, you know, to be an ally and to continue to, to, to continue to do all of this valuable work, it really is about reaching out to people, asking how their day is being and how that you can continue to be a force for good in their lives. There's so many people with so many fantastic ideas and passion that I never knew had it in them to be very strong leaders and to really develop it because they were, you know, forced into silence by American society and the pressures that um, are put upon them. So I think it's definitely just making sure that people are there uh, for these different communities, making sure that you're actively reaching out and just being a force for good in their lives. She, in my saw a question from Sharon Barney, which said, what resources, what are some additional resources that our community needs to make Asian Americans feel safer here? Yes. Yes, and actually there was another one about what would be the most helpful actions that I could take as an ally. So I think they're related. I do want to say that um, a lot of the, uh, uh, my, uh, well, I think that I, I have benefited quite a bit uh, from a lot of allies uh, in the white community. Uh, I think that uh, Gene McManus, uh, a borough council member, uh, was a big ally. I think that uh, uh, others I recall, uh, well, Elizabeth Gorham, certainly, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, my predecessor as mayor. 
um, Professor Donald Dowd, and, uh, my constitutional law professor. I mean, the thing is, it's, uh, I think that um, there's always room uh, to reach out. And I think that, um, uh, I mean, I, I think uh, connecting on a human level and basically seeing talent um, in people you don't, who don't look like you uh, is I think something that, uh, that I really value. And I try to do that with others as well. And that's what your allies did for you. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I think um, one, one question that, you know, about how, how to be an ally. So I, I mentioned this idea of perpetual immigrant and it's really interesting in state college, even after 30 years, I'm sometimes asked to set up an international table or, um, you know, and, or somebody, and I've agreed sometimes and said, you know, I'll do that, but can you just call it the American table, I'll bring the same things, but you know, can we have it? Or, or the, or the expression of you know, seeing kids who look like me, but you're thinking of them as foreign students, but they're actually, so that whole idea, I think just changing that will change who we think of as Americans, who we think of as, you know, you just going and asking somebody um, you know, to, to be on a board to be on a board, you know, like you begin to think of people differently if you begin to think of them as belonging. So I think that's a very big first step. Unfortunately, a lot of the United States works on networks and then belonging, we bring those people into the networks that we are creating. Uh, I always tell people, start with your book clubs, look at how they look, who's on it, and you begin to see who you're leaving out. So I think it's really, really important. Starts from neighborhood organizations. To, and don't say that you know, certain people are not here. Um, I think it's up to us to figure out what's stopping people from coming. So do some very active outreach. Yes, yes. Can I add on to that? Sure. Um, so something that like I've noticed through like cutie pop queer and trans people of color is that a lot of people want to collaborate with us and it's like I need to figure out if people want to collaborate with us as like purposeful collaboration versus like like showmanship collaboration and like like I don't want to be tokenized and I don't want like people in my community be, to be tokenized just for people to say like oh like we've worked with this group of people um or like why aren't you coming to our spaces and stuff like that and the question is always why aren't you here rather than why aren't you here like if that makes sense it's um why what is making you uncomfortable in this space that you're not going to be here and I think that's the question that people need to to ask rather than like why aren't you here it's like how do I make you comfortable so that you can come into my space and not feel like you're gonna have a microaggression or, you know, you were scared to be in this space because X, Y, and Z like might happen. Um, and like, that's what I'm like, that's what being an ally is more than just like showing up for pride or showing up for the march. It's showing up like at the vigil. It's showing up like when you see someone on the street who's like crying or something, like when you see something happening, that's when you need to be here. Not when like, not when there's cameras, not when like you can be photographed or you can have an interview. Cause that's what, there's a lot of performative activism out here. And a lot of people are doing it for like the clout or to be on TV or, you know, to have the big like headline. It's, it's not about that. Like, I think that being an ally is sitting in the back and listening it's not saying it's not taking the microphone and being like hey like I support you like obviously you support us if you're here you know um and that's like something I've seen at a lot of like things down in Alice Street Gates where like you know like people who are white are at Black Lives Matter marches and they take the microphone and they talk for 15 minutes like you can do that every single day of your life and you're taking time away from black people who want to talk about their stories and stuff like that like I understand that you're an ally and you want to be here and like show your support but the best way you can do that is sit down listen and share what you know like and that's like what I would have to say about like being a better ally and so piggybacking off of that then the other another piece I'd like to add is in order to be an ally you need to self-reflect go to projectimplicit.org and take those implicit bias tests. And actually, please go and take them across the board and you'll find out a bunch of stuff about 
you know, your, the glasses, the lenses that you see things with that you may not even be conscious of. I mean, I did and I did. So kind of what Celeste was talking about, about the microaggressions and other things, we need to work on ourselves in whatever spaces that we're in to make things welcoming for everybody rather than just keep trying to change other people. Anybody yeah. else? <laughs> I also wanted to say, because I have three boys and my frame of reference, because I grew up in 1980s dictatorship Korea. So I have very low tolerance when it comes to struggles. And my youngest always say, just because you, can, you have uh, this tangible experience from 1980s Korea when you, there is like a pro-democracy movement does that doesn't mean my experience it's you, you cannot minimize my experience because everyone's perceived things differently personally so for me it was difficult for to uh, overcome my implicit bias how you guys are privileged here you are not like growing up in Korea so that that, that was difficult for me yeah, but with thanks to this lockdown, so there are two ways to see the blessing in disguise. But I was able to talk to many things with my youngest currently living at home, and you know, we got to know each other, understand better through food. <laughs> so trying out ethnic food is a great idea. When you say Asian food, that doesn't mean Chinese. <laughs> there is all different variant food. Yes. Yes. Well, I shall do. we go ahead? I, I just, uh, Asian food and uh, spices always reminds me of the struggles that kids go through when they take lunches to school. Oh. <laughs> and I had this friend who recently wrote an article about, you know, raising Indian American kids and she, she's a teacher. And then she said, if people just knew that Columbus found the United States in searching for spices that were found in India, and accidentally landed, you know, found the United States. And these are the spices in this lunchbox that you are bullying somebody for. So I think, you know, yeah, food is great and there's no food. I, I like the idea of, you know, we look at things as different, but not lesser or uh, worse. Like, can we just say that this is just different, but one doesn't have to be better than the other or worse than the other? And I think that would be a thought too. Let me say one more thing, just because Natalie mentioned Columbus, right? So when Columbus sailed to America, the Dutchess are sailing all over, right? So they brought hot peppers on their ship to Japan and Japanese, Japanese, when they invaded Korea in 1592, they used the hot peppers as a biological weapons, right? Being an island, pepper doesn't do anything for Japanese, but Korea, it's a peninsula, it's cold, long win winters, right? So that's how they, <laughs> they grow them. So when you think of kimchi as a spice, Korean, no, it's from the new world crop through Dutch, through Japanese and now symbolize Korean culture. Great, thank you. So there's one other question I'd really like to, to touch on. We've got about eight more minutes or so so this may be may end up being the last question for everybody to respond to. But this question is, how do you overcome the troubling moments of race-based aggression? And what are your coping strategies? So I, I let me butt in here. Um, there's a Buddhist saying, and so this is what I'm working on in myself. There's a Buddhist saying that says we can't cover, you know, there's thorns all over the world. We can't cover the whole world with leather, but if we learn to wear shoes, right, or wear leather over the soles of our feet, that's essentially equivalent to the same thing. So maybe it's all, maybe it's just another way of putting that question. So what, what are your soles? What do you cover your feet with? What do you do to, in, in troubling moments? For me, prayers and positive vibe. Whenever I go out, I armed myself with the healing energy of power. And then whenever I see people, I pray for them. So it brings out really positive energy. It's like a paying it forward. In my, uh, for me, it's always um, been action and speaking up. Um, as, as basically that I'm thinking that there's something I can do, but I also a lot of self-reflection recently has shown me 
that I have actually silenced myself a lot. And I mean by that is just because um, of having to translate sometimes in spaces where I want to be more uh, plain than I'm allowing myself to be. I mean that way, right? So just in order to be heard, I've had to change what I really wanted to say. And so that's you know, and when I realized that I was actually, I'm not happy because I don't want to be doing that. So I'm working on it. But I know if I talk the way I want to, I won't be heard either, so. Yes. I think I would also say that action is definitely the way that I have personally like dealt with that, but it's also like alone time so that like I can like, like I shut off my phone whenever like things happen like that like after I like check up on my friends but like I take time alone and time to myself where I can like cry like a good cry will like crying really does help you and it is like it's nice like sometimes you need to cry and you need to let your your emotions like go wild and like do your thing because if you keep those emotions like you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna hurt other people based upon like emotions that you harbor within yourself so like 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 I love going out and like doing a rally or doing a march or like going to like planning something and like having something to be done but at the end of the day like you have to go home after that and like Mm -hmm. go home to your family or go home to whatever you have and if you're not like mentally okay or if you're just like blocking yourself from feeling things like that's not going to help you or the other people around you you know like you in order to lead, you also need to take care of yourself. And I think that's something that people don't talk about. Yeah, I, I want to echo that. I think self-care is essential because often as um, leaders and as people who want to be allies, mm-hmm. you need to take care of yourself before you take care of other people. Um, and it's it's so, you know, it's such a cliche that people put up, but like for me, um, this year, I know one of the one of earlier into the sem- first semester of with COVID and everything hitting, I remember just being so overwhelmed with my online classes and with um, trying to advocate for Penn State. Uh, we had this giant debate in student government about whether or not Penn State should, you know, close or stay open because of COVID, um, all of this. And, and there was just a lot of stress weighing on me. Um, and I went to CAPS, which is the Counseling Psychological Services at Penn State, and I just had a 30-minute counseling session for the first time in my life. Um, it's, it's, it's funny because um, I think, you know, for a lot of Chinese Americans, um, mental health isn't something we talk about because it's like a sign of weakness if you're, if you're someone who needs to go counseling or get something like that. But it was, you know, it was one of the best experiences of my life, honestly, to be able to just sit down and just talk about my issues with other people, like let them know that these issues are stressed, um, I'm stressed and that these issues are perfectly valid. Um, and afterwards, it was so much easier to, to get back on track, to understand what I need to do to protect my communities, to protect Penn State, to really continue advocating for students. Um, and I think it's, it's so important because, you know, stu- I think a lot of leaders, especially from my experience, often feel like because they have to be the rock in the societies and the organizations that they are part of, that they can't show any weakness. But showing weakness is part of being human. It's part of all of us. Um, and you just have to understand sometimes that you need to slow down. Um, these things will get the better of you. And I think the more you keep it inside, the more difficult it is to move forward and continue to be productive and being a voice of supporting the community. And so definitely making sure that you take care of yourself before everything else. Yes. Jean, I want to thank Celeste and Stephen for all their wisdom. I feel like they are, thank you. Thank you, like uh, just the leaders that we've been waiting for. Yeah, it's true. So to help clean up the mess that we've made, we older (laughs) folks. I mean, seriously. So, yes. I sort of, first of all, Shima, that was too good a question. (laughs) And I think that it's unfortunately, uh, let me, um, it, it causes me to reflect. And quite frankly, one of the things I reflected upon is how I've dealt with it in the past. And quite frankly, it has oftentimes been in a very negative way. Uh, Oftentimes, I think it's uh, self-hatred. I have to say that when, when, uh, around junior high school, when I was the height of the bullying, 
I tended to turn against um, my background. Uh, it's mm. sort of uh, the, I tended to basically, I think I you call it uh, adopting Mozart and Michelangelo and McDonald's rather than uh, kimchi uh, uh, band dancing and, uh, and, and brush paint. I mean, I think that uh, in many ways, I, I, uh, there was a period of time in which I refused to speak Korean, uh, despite my, uh, causing probably my parents a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, it, is, it is a period of, I mean, I think that there is quite a danger when one faces this hatred of hating yourself, mm -hmm. hating uh, and... I think that it is, uh, I mean, that's something that, uh, so, I mean, I guess, unfortunately, I can't think of a productive way to basically respond to that question. Uh, all I can say is that there is a danger uh, when of turning against yourself, turning against your background. And, uh, and I, uh, basically I'm saying that, uh, all I can come up with something that you should do. Okay, so we're basically almost at the end of time in respect to people's time, but I do have one thing to say about self-hate because I had a whole lot of it growing up, a lot of it. And so therapy helped, right? Being honest about it, journaling helped, having my alone time helped. And also one of the things, I guess I was a math major as an undergrad. And one of the things that really struck me was I, somebody said at some workshop, so I took a bunch of workshops as well, a lot more inner work, was you can't prove you're good enough because you are. Definitely. You can't prove you're good enough because you are. And I realized that I spent a lot of my time, I mean, a lot of my time as a younger person trying to prove, I mean, even into my 30s, 40s, right? Till I really started doing some of this deep dive and in inner work meditation also prayer but um to realize that i'd spent so much of my life trying to prove i was good enough and because of the self-hate because of the um the perception or whatever I, I was never going to succeed at it because it's a fundamental truth of who we are of what we are of what is possible for us um anyway so I'm sorry, I really do want to respect time. So let's come up to close. Um, so I hope I haven't cut you all off. Um, so to the panel, again, deepest gratitude for this honest, open, clear to me conversation um, and sharing. I looks from the chat that a lot of people have gotten a lot out of it. For those of you who've come tonight, thank you for coming. I hope it's been meaningful for you and you've gotten some insights and ideas and resolve to going forward. In the next week, you'll receive two emails, a post event survey, including the opportunity to offer ideas as well as to give feedback about this event and a list of resources to help you educate yourself, self-reflect, nurture empathy and take action. As we prepare to return to our ordinary lives, let's remember this teaching from the Cherokee Nation. One evening, an elderly Cherokee brave told his grandson about the battle that goes on inside people. He said, my son, the battle is between two wolves inside us all. One is evil. It is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. The other is good. It's joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The grandson thought about it for a minute, and then he asked his grandfather, which wolf wins? 
The old Cherokee replied simply, the one that you feed. Mm -hmm. So this ends the main program. For those of you who can stay, I invite you to stay for this heartfelt seven minute YouTube, but I realize it's now 8.30 and we've ended just on time. <laughs> it's called Stand Together in Solidarity. So on April 22nd, more than 10,000 people gathered for a multiracial interfaith vigil to grieve and stand in solidarity with the Sikh community after the mass shooting in Indianapolis. The massacre touches the open wound of decades long racial trauma. We were joined, we together were joined by faith leaders, artists, activists, and Sikh community members. It was a tapestry of testimony, witness, music, poetry, prayer, and a song in the Sikh spirit and song in the Sikh spirit of Chardi Kala. In the wake of so much trauma, we're modeling what America could be, a multiracial, multi-faith, beloved community. Thank you again. Namaste. just putting my girls to bed and as six have done nightly for centuries we sang Sohila and one line stuck with me Tum gavo mere nirpo ka Sohila Ho vari jit Sohile Sada sukh hoi Raho Sing the song of my fearless one I sacrifice myself to that song That is eternal joy Fearlessness in the face of hate. Joy in the face of terror. My father was, was a farmer from a rural village in Punjab. My mother was also a farmer. And I recall one of the fondest memories that I have about him is how deep he used to dig his hands into the soil. If this is a land that is formed from genocide, colonization, slavery, then we must all become like our ancestors, like my father, and all become farmers. And we need to dig our hands so deep in this soil that we change the bedrock and the foundation of this country going forward for our children. I am here to stand in solidarity with my sick family. I am here to bring visibility to my Asian kindred because I know as a product of the Black church tradition that our well being, our flourishing, and indeed our liberation are tied together. We will not forget the beautiful lives we lost in Indianapolis last week and that we will stand with you together for as long as it takes today, tomorrow, until we can have true justice and healing in this country. It's when we stand together and we stand together at the front line that actually that's when the healing of my community began to take place. And so we will be with you. We will be with you in the darkest hour and we will continue to be with you. We are connected. And when you hurt, we hurt. When I hurt, you hurt. When death visits the sick community, death visits us all. We call on America to lift up and not forget these our sick brothers and sisters because we cannot be selective. We have to have the capacity to see it all, to mourn it all, to cry over it all, 
to stand against it all, to fight against it all. We all are brothers and sisters, and we all have life that no human being has a right to take. We've been reminded that while there is shared pain, there is also shared struggle. We've been reminded that even though everything is heavy and everything is hard, that we can look to the strength and resilience and histories of our ancestors. Our ancestors refused to submit and disappear. They hung fast to our languages, our spiritualities and our cultures. It's those things, the things that make us who we are, that give us strength. The very things they wanted to eradicate is what helped us to persevere and to survive. The scream is being awakened in us today. With every gunshot, we are roused to scream to the Holy One, to insist that there must be another way. We will tell new stories about ourselves and about our world, stories of hope and healing, stories of justice and belonging, stories of redemption, and stories of revolutionary love. And I can tell you that from this, we will all come out stronger. If there is anything that I can do, my community can do, for any one of you at this time, please don't hesitate in reaching out. I stand with you tonight, and I will stand with you for as long as you will let me. Say, I am lost in the desert. Your voice calls me home. We bear witness to each other's suffering and anguish, and in that bearing witness is a healing. I'm going out to educate more people, tell about my turban, tell about my culture, tell about my Sikhism, who we are. I know this work is bigger than my people, that I have a larger community that wants what my people want, which is safety and true freedom. Freedom from hate, freedom to love, freedom to live and to thrive. Somebody's first call. Oh, somebody's beloved. Remember, you don't have to know people in order to grieve with them. You grieve with them in order to know them. Six are not just victims. We have wisdom to offer America about longevity and resilience in the face of oppression. Our gathering tonight is in the sick spirit of Chardikala, ever rising spirits even in darkness ever rising joy even in the labors for justice as if to say they can colonize us they can terrorize us they can massacre us but they cannot crush us we are sovereign So thank you again, everyone, um, for coming. Thank you so much gratitude to the panelists, those who shared their lives. And so anyway, good night, namaste, be well, be safe, be happy, and love.